Hello, Akira here, and welcome back to the channel. In today's video essay, we're going to be analysing one of the core features of Fire Emblem Combat, the counter-attack, why it's so important as a gameplay mechanic, and how removing it affects the game. The last part is based on an FE8 run that I conducted for this video where I removed the mechanic entirely. Though the various Fire Emblem games have had different gameplay mechanics, the core Fire Emblem combat loop has always remained very similar. One unit attacks another, and then faces a counter-attack in return if possible as part of that same round of combat. This counter means that you can't simply think only about your own unit's attack, but also whether the enemy will kill you in return if you don't remove them from the field, whether that's because you don't deal enough damage, or if it's possible for you to miss your attack. Going beyond player phase though, it's why in many of the games when comparing units to one another, any phase combat potential is so important. While your player phase action economy usually limits you to killing a maximum of one enemy per unit of your own per turn, over a single enemy phase, you can potentially kill several enemies with a single character. This culminates in LTCs, where route maps can sometimes be cleared within just a couple of turns. Unsurprisingly, this means that the ability to counterattack, and to counterattack well, greatly affects your overall combat on enemy phase. As three general examples, units without the ability to counter nearly all enemy types on enemy phase, i.e. units without easy access to 1-2 range, such as sword locked and slash or bow locked units are often penalised in unit viability discussions, especially the bow locked ones. The ability to easily set up units with an enemy phase advantage one shot build, such as a Van Rath build in the case of Battalion Van Rath Dimitri from Free Houses, or simply stacking high attack like with Great Thunder 4 and Citrine from Engage, or Super Ophelia from Fate, is counted as a point in their favour. As a semi-combination of the two points, you need to consider how a unit may suffer from success if they kill too many enemies on enemy phase and open themselves up to additional attacks during the process. This can lead to one method of approaching defend maps being to wall off the enemies with unequipped units and store them out, as is recommended in a base conversation for one of the chapters of Path of Radiance. Outside of the viability of recruitable units, enemies being able to counter within the round of combat where you initiate on them also affects how you approach them. This is most notable in how many bosses have a 1-2 range weapon, or a mix of 1 range and 2 range weapons, meaning that you can't necessarily trivially attack them from a certain range in order to kill them over time and not face their counters, which are strong compared to the enemies more broadly. This can be brought to its extreme in the Free Houses skill aptly named Counterattack, which allows a unit to counter any range. Conversely, a boss with only 1 range, such as Geb in Chapter 9b of Sacred Stones, is very easy to chip down and even potentially farm experience off of this way, which is a practice known as boss abuse. This automatic counterattack isn't a staple of all other strategy games, though there may be other differences in combat flow. For example, after leaving Fire Emblem, Kaga went on to make Berwick Saga, where if a unit takes damage in a round of combat, they cannot counter unless they have the counter skill, though if the attacking unit misses, the opponent may be able to counter. As another example, most characters from Triangle Strategy cannot retaliate if attacked, the countering being part of only a few units' design. As mentioned though, the combat systems are not entirely the same. While Fire Emblem has strict player and enemy phases, these games do not. In Berwick Saga, each turn has roughly the number of slots in ratio with the number of playable and enemy units. For example, in the image on screen now, there are 9 red units and 2 blue units, meaning that in this turn, the red units get 4 actions and the blue units get 1. Then the triangle strategy has an action priority based partly on a unit's speed stat. This is different from the Berwick system in that a fast character may be able to move multiple times before a slow one is able to, with bosses often being able to take actions more frequently than player units, especially on higher difficulties. So, what happens if we remove counterattacks? To an extent, this is actually something that we can glean from some situations in vanilla Fire Emblem where you aren't countering the enemy. Some examples include enemies that use siege tomes or that otherwise outrange you, like the Corrupted Worms from Engage, who have a 1 to 3 range weapon and a weaker 4 range weapon that you cannot counter, except through the very specific setup of Sauron Engage Bolting, which also requires the DLC. Another example, also from Engage, is the usage of Engage attacks by some enemies with emblems, which are always uncounterable and will always hit. Self-evidently, since you can't kill them on enemy phase, you have to actually use player phase actions to get rid of them. In the case of engage attacks as well, as a tool that the player also has access to, and has far more frequent access to than the enemy at that. It means that squishy units are able to take engagements completely safely, even if a standard counter would kill them. Still, 
these cases are outliers rather than the general case. So, I was curious, what would happen if we removed all units' abilities to counterattack entirely? I decided to test this by editing Fire Emblem the Sacred Stones in FE Builder, so that all weapons disable enemy counters. In my playthrough, I chose difficult mode, went on Erica route, and didn't use the Tower of Volney or Skirmishes at all. Then I didn't reset after chapter 9, including through unit deaths. Before I go into my findings, I'll give my prior guesses on how no counters would affect the game. My four general hypotheses rather than those about individual units such as Seth going in were as follows. 1. Juggernauting is no longer possible. Due to only being able to kill one unit per turn maximum, any singular unit extended too far from the rest of the army runs the risk of getting surrounded by enemies for several turns. 2. Unit frailty overall becomes less impactful. On player phase, unit frailty is evidently entirely inconsequential, with high attack and doubling potential being key for securing any kills. Additionally, it is no longer possible to suffer from success on enemy phase, meaning that a unit is guaranteed to only see a certain number of rounds of enemy phase combat, and thus does not need as much durability to survive, especially in combination with proper positioning. 3. A lack of 1-2 range is no longer a death knell for comparative unit viability. That being said, it does still have a purpose, as you may want to be able to reach an enemy at the edge of your range. Two range locked weapons should also be more valuable than one range locked weapon for this reason, though I suspect the overall value gap between 1, 1, 2 and 2 range weapons is overall reduced more than anything. 4. Maps are going to take many more turns than usual. This has two aspects. The first obvious aspect is that since we have to kill any enemies on player phase and thus have to expend more actions to get rid of them, this process will take more turns as the number of player phase actions per turn are limited compared to the number of potential enemy phase counters if we had them. The second one is perhaps less obvious. By not clearing maps within a relatively low number of turns, we may open ourselves up to additional factors that further slow down the map, such as reinforcement on a route map that we will have to make the effort to kill, that we would not have seen if we routed the enemies before their turn trigger. Though I don't think it's as noteworthy as the four hypotheses above, it's worth noting that stationary enemies, such as bosses, are now entirely trivial to defeat. So any challenges, I imagine, will come more from pileups of enemies rather than individual enemies themselves. So, with our hypotheses in place, how did the run go? It was a really weird run, with lots of retreating required. There were several moments that went counter to my instincts on how I would normally approach the maps. In particular, many chapters required much more thought than usual with regard to unit positioning, with three standout examples being Chapter 6, the first fog map, where Seth ends up getting trapped on the fort for dozens of turns, dealing with all the enemies while Erica and Vanessa helped out the green units. Chapter 10A, where the flyer and cavalry enforcement, in addition to the ballistae, severely limited the number of safe squares people could stand on due to not being able to kill enemies far away from the bulk of the army. And Chapter 17, where my lack of a bulky non-merf flyer severely impacted my approach to the wyvern reinforcements from the top left corner of the map. Still, past this cursory look, I think it makes the most sense to go through the hypotheses in order. So, first of all, effective juggernauting was indeed very much not possible in the traditional sense, where you stand somewhere and kill all the enemies on enemy phase. Even as early as chapter two, there are several moments where Seth got boxed in by enemies for several turns, most marked examples of this were when he had to deal with basically all of the enemies on the map, including the reinforcements in Chapter 6 before being able to reach Novala, and then being unable to clear a path to Amelia in Chapter 9a before she left at the end of Turn 11, and getting surrounded in the process. Indeed, such attempts to have Seth handle areas on his own eventually led to him dying, after getting stuck up until the nearby Gorgon eggs hatched in Chapter 18. Leading on from this, while unit frailty became less important for individual rounds of combat, for attempting to juggernaut in some sense, it became invaluable. In terms of unit frailty generally becoming less important, Erica actually became a unit who could be used pretty easily, if one with strength on the lower side. The triple effective repair was a great boon for being able to one round KO many cav and armoured enemies, in a setting where player phase bulk is irrelevant, and the primary measure of a combat unit is whether they're able to one round KO one enemy on said player phase. Similar things abounded with Joshua, where him being able to take exactly one hit was sufficient for acting as a wall. Conversely, this also meant that Gilliam got benched early, 
as the difference between taking 1 hit and 5 was far less important than the difference between 0 and 1. There was still a possible form of late game juggernauting present though in the form of tanking, which is unique to Mur due to the Dragonstone 15 defense and 20 res stat bonuses. The lack of counters made her far more sturdy due to no longer using the Dragonstone on enemy phase, and with the Philly shield in her inventory, made her nigh invulnerable to everything. This meant that she could survive her solitary trip on chapter 18 where Seth could not. While not strictly necessary due to units not having to be able to take as many hits as they normally could, it did make her an extremely convenient unit to use, especially when I decided post chapter 10 to just treat the run as an Iron Man. Regarding range, I do believe that any given weapon's range mattered far less than a standard FE. 1-2 range did still have a niche for reaching enemies more flexibly, or for units who got trapped in, Read, Seth getting trapped on his own and only having 5 inventory slots. But it was just that, a niche. Both 2 and 1 range locked weapons were generally stronger and more accurate, leading to the great usage of Inez and Joshua, respectively. The bows, the stocks definitely went up, as having the ability to use a high might weapon with positioning flexibility, even sometimes with the longbow, was very valuable. Mind, even for a cast as small as FE8s, the sample size for this is extremely small, consisting solely of Inez. Naomi is, well, herself. And then I didn't promote Ross into a warrior, nor Garrick into a ranger. Both I think could actually have contributed more if they had though. In chapter 17, when the Wyverns were coming for the river folk, I found myself wishing frequently that they had bow access. And then regarding Joshua, he saw a lot of usage and was one of my best units. This I wasn't surprised by, since in a Cephalus FE8 LTC done by Crash Boom Bang, he was in the top 3 units by wins and battles, and he has also been analysed in a video by my friend and fellow FE tuber, Actual Lizard, on Erica Route, which concluded that he is a good but not stellar unit. Lizard's analysis identified what I believe to be the three things that hold him back from being great, in the forms of no 1-2 range for enemy phase juggernauting, which is not a factor here at all. Infantry move, which is less of an issue when the lack of enemy phase counters means that we're traversing far fewer tiles per turn on average, and limited special utility, with the best example being that he can reliably hit the doubling threshold on Kaluk with the S rank sword at Holmer. In this playthrough, this was even special utility that was supplanted by Seth, as he naturally grew enough speed to double Kaluk. Still, in this setting, having exceptional player phase combat was plenty. Lastly, I was indeed correct that the inherent action economy limitation would affect many aspects of gameplay relating to turn count. I saw a ton of reinforcements, running out all the Pegasi in chapter 15, Scorched Sand, and all the enemies in chapter 17, River of Regrets as well. Many side objectives were also far more difficult to secure. As three examples, chapter 6, Victims of War with Novala, was fiddly to manoeuvre Erica and Vanessa such that they could keep all the green units alive for the Ryan's Bolt. Which I sold, and so was definitely not worth the hassle. It was much more of a pain to get than zero speed FE8, which doesn't disable counterattacks, where Seth was actually able to reach the boss, before any intervention had to be taken to save the citizens. Next, in chapter 9a, Distant Blade, I initially very much wanted to steal Amelia's Speedwing to get a second one on chapter 13a, since this circumstance means that it's free to bait her as an enemy, because my own unit would never counter. This proved to be impossible, and it even proved impossible to get to recruit her with Erica, as the enemy clog and density was too much for anyone other than Seth to reach and reliably survive. Thirdly, in chapter 17, keeping all the river folk alive for the rescue staff was strange, since Mur wasn't yet spectacularly trained, and I was consciously iron manning by this point. I ended up having to rescue drop them all out of danger first to the area around spawn, and then to the middle left edge of the map, while my units formed a weird choke point around the snag. Still though, some chapters main objectives were very doable in a low number of turns. As a pre-warp example, in chapter 13a, Hamel Canyon, I was able to kill the boss, and therefore clear the map before Cormag showed up, meaning that I missed him entirely. And then especially once warp came online, many clears closely resembled vanilla clears. All of chapter 19, Last Hope, Chapter 20, Darkling Woods, and the first part of the finale involved key warps, albeit not at the pace of an LTC warp skip proper. Removing the counter-attack mechanic affected comparative unit strength and gameplay flow, and therefore both tactical decisions on how to approach specific maps, and strategic choices more broadly. 
trying to approach situations in the same way as in vanilla FE8 often ended differently, and poorly, as with Seth's death in chapter 18, and many resets over chapters 6 and 9a. Run felt so different that I'd actually say it was largely fire and only in appearance. So hopefully I've convinced you of how important the counterattack is as a gameplay mechanic in Fire Emblem. At the very least, I hope that I've given you an interesting case study in what a run where they're removed might look like. If you want to try this for yourself, for some reason, you can find a link to the patch file in the description below to be applied to an unaltered USA FE8 ROM. Thanks for watching, I hope that you enjoyed this mix of video essay proper and playthrough analysis. If you did, please consider liking the video or subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. It means a lot to me and helps the channel to grow, We're getting really close to 1000 subscribers at which point I can have my channel monetized. So yeah, if you'd like to see more of this, please do tell me in the comments as well. I think I may be able to do something similar for the lack of a wait command, with rather explosively enforced consequences if a unit has to wait. No attack command I could definitely do something for, though this has already been done for a few games. The ones I'm aware of are FE7 by Hoshi the Hero on Mecha's channel, Three Houses with only Byleth by Jack Benchy and a Three Houses Iron Man by Atano, and Engage by TG. And then I do have some other ideas as well. Okay, we can call this series that's partly mechanical analysis, partly playthrough analysis, F features, with both the F and E being capitalised because FE, Fire Emblem, get it? I'll see myself out. On that note, thanks again for watching. Hope to see you again next time. Until then, have a good one.